Hey, hey, everybody. What's good? Welcome to my Morrowind guide about enchanting. We're gonna start by getting everyone up to speed on the fundamentals of enchanting because, frankly, the UI is a little intimidating and there's literally no in-game tutorial. So a lot of folks just end up avoiding it, which is kind of unfortunate because it's pretty cool. Anyways, then we'll go over some of the more advanced stuff, cover some formulae, and make some recommendations along the way. As always, I've got timestamps in the description so you can skip past the basics if you've already got all that on lockdown. Okay, at the most basic level, Enchanting in Morrowind revolves around using the souls of felled opponents contained within various soul gems to add spell effects to your otherwise mundane items. The items you can enchant include nearly anything your character can equip, from weapons to armor to clothing to accessories. I believe the only exception to this rule is ammunition for ranged weapons. You can also enchant blank paper and certain paper-based items into single-use magical scrolls, sort of like the kind you often see vendors selling. Anyways, the souls are first captured using a soul trap spell effect on a creature or a few select specific characters, and then you'd kill it while the effect is still active. Note that soul trap is a mysticism spell, not conjuration like it is in later games. There's also no distinction in Morrowind between white and black souls, which in other games are the souls of NPCs. Anyways, that trapped soul then goes into the smallest empty soul gem you're carrying that has the capacity necessary to contain it. There are five different standard soul gems in Morrowind, each with their own capacity and one unique artifact soul gem. What makes this artifact, Azura Star, special is that unlike standard soul gems, the gem itself will remain intact even after the soul contained is spent. Every creature type in the game also has a specific soul size. Thankfully though, it's not really necessary to keep track of the majority of that information. We'll go into detail on that in just a bit. Anyways, you can then take your filled soul gem to an enchanter to use on one of your items. Alternatively, you can use your own enchanting skill to perform this yourself. There are up to three different types of enchantments you can place on an item. These are On Use, On Strike, and Constant Effect. On Use enchantments involve you using and casting an item like you would a regular spell. For example, the ring you find in the barrel during the tutorial is an On Use item. Keep in mind that unlike actual spells, On Use enchantments always successfully cast so long as there's sufficient charge remaining. On strike enchantments are only available for weapons. As you might guess, they apply their magic effect to your opponent whenever you land a blow with that weapon. It's super important to know that on strike effects should never be applied to bows or crossbows, because you technically never strike an enemy with your actual ranged weapon the effect never activates. Constant effect enchantments are your more traditional form of item enchantment, in that they passively provide the listed spell effect to your character, as long as the item is equipped. It's important to know that constant effect enchantments are only possible when using a 400 or higher sized soul contained in either a grand soul gem or the reusable soul gem artifact Azura Star. There's really only two enemies in Morrowind with a 400 plus soul size that you should concern yourself with, that being Ascended Sleepers and Golden Saints. The rest are unique entities that will never respawn if killed. As for Grand Soul Gems, they're relatively uncommon. However, in the Tribunal expansion, the enchanting vendor Albert Nurmark sells five empty grand soul gems and will restock them over time. That said, I really recommend just getting Azura Star if you're interested in getting serious about enchanting. In addition to enchanting items, 
you can use a filled soul gem to recharge an already enchanted item that has an on-use or on-strike effect. Fortunately, these items slowly recharge as in-game time passes, so it's usually not necessary to do this. However, it's worth knowing that when you recharge an item, you increase your enchanting skill by the same amount as when you create an enchanted item. These are actually two of the fastest ways to level your enchanting skill. Using enchanted items also increases your skill progress by a very small amount. It's plus 0.1 progress as opposed to the plus 5.0 that you get from recharging and creating enchanted items. Because of this, it can be pretty tedious to manually level your enchanting skill. So consider making use of skill trainer NPCs, especially if you don't yet have access to Azura Star. Otherwise, you're just going to be burning through money and soul gems like crazy. Now, we'll cover more intermediate and advanced concepts of Morrowind's enchanting. The first being that conjuration is just an invaluable asset to enchanting. That's because you can actually soul trap your own summoned creatures, kill them, and use their souls just like you would any others. This is made even better because you can summon golden saints who have that coveted 400 point soul size. You can pick up this useful conjuration spell at Telbranora from Phelan Marion. It's important to know that if you're keen on seeking this guy out, you're gonna need a levitate spell or potion to reach his room. Now that we've got all that down, let's also take a look at a few useful enchantment effects to keep in mind in the event that you're in need of some inspiration for enchanting effects to work towards. Perhaps the most immediately useful effect, if you're a melee or ranged weapon using character, is getting a weapon with soul trap for when you want to farm out a bunch of filled soul gems at once, or just keep running through that Azura star. For melee weapons, a two second duration for buffs and debuffs is generally a safe bet when it comes to on strike effects to ensure roughly 100% uptime and low costs. For ranged weapons, your mileage is gonna vary as projectile travel time and your target's distance is a big factor. Anyhow, a less obvious but absurdly powerful on strike effect is fortifying an attribute. 100 strength on strike for just two seconds is surprisingly cost effective and can net better returns than even raw damage dealing enchants when you're in higher weapon tiers that also have high base damage. Consider other attributes too, like agility if you're manually training up an underdeveloped weapon skill. Constant Effect is similar in that it has plenty of obvious and helpful uses, like a constant effect for restoring health, magicka, or fatigue. But there's several less obvious options that are just as valuable. For example, if you make use of a lot of on-strike and on-use enchantments, consider fortifying your enchant skill to 110. This makes those enchantments only use a single point of their charge each use. There's a few important things to note about Constant Effect enchantments as well. The first is that Constant Effect invisibility still functions the same in that it goes away when your character interacts with something, so you'll need to re-equip the item to regain the effect. Secondly, consider creating Constant Effect enchantments with a 1 to whatever range, rather than setting the minimum and maximum to be equal. With a one point minimum, you can reach a higher maximum for a similar cost as a constant effect enchantment that sports no range where the minimum and maximum are equal. The caveat here though, is that the benefits you get are randomly generated from your specified range each time you equip that item. So you'll need to unequip and re-equip such items until you get the maximum possible magnitude, or at least one you're satisfied with. This can get pretty tedious and downright frustrating 
especially if your enchanted item has multiple effects sporting such magnitude ranges. Anyways, let's finally get down to brass tacks and start taking a look at how some of these enchanting costs are calculated. The cost of an enchantment must be equal to or less than an item's maximum enchantment capacity. There's no way to increase an item's capacity. Later on, I will list off some of the highest capacity items, if you're interested. Anyways, on screen now are the formulae used to calculate the cost for on-touch and on-self effects, on-target effects, and any constant effects. Right off the bat, we can see that on-touch and on-self are pretty much always going to be the lowest cost, as long as their duration is less than 100 seconds. Constant effect enchantments, on the other hand, will usually have the highest costs, unless you're working with an on-target enchantment that has a significant duration. Now that we have this basic understanding, let's look at the specifics of the formulae so that we can draw some general conclusions to keep in mind when we're enchanting. First, the biggest impact to an enchantment's cost is the spell effect's base cost. I'll have a link in the description to some tables from the good people at UESP.net that lists all of the base costs in the game if you're interested. Next, we can see that the minimum and maximum magnitudes play a large role in determining enchantment costs. This is why, as we covered earlier, having a minimum magnitude of 1 is way more cost effective when it comes to constant effect enchantments. Essentially, your maximum can be double the amount of an enchantment where the min and max are equal. As far as duration and area is concerned, there isn't much advice to give on them. Besides, try to keep them as low as possible. Keep in mind that an effect that deals 20 fire damage immediately is going to have the same cost as an effect that deals 4 fire damage Per second over five seconds. Now keeping all of that in mind, it's important to know that enchanting costs get a little weird when you start to add multiple effects to a single item. While it's true that the more effects you add to a single item, the enchantment cost increases significantly, arranging the order in which set effects are applied also has an impact on the cost. This is because each added effect has its cost multiplied by the number of effects listed after it and itself. So let's say we're thinking of making an enchanted item with four different effects. The first listed enchantment will have its cost multiplied by four, the second multiplied by three, the third multiplied by two, and the final one is multiplied by one so its cost is unchanged. If that was a little hard to follow, the important takeaway from this is that if you want multiple enchantment effects, consider spreading those effects across several items, so you have one effect per item. That way you can have higher magnitudes on those effects for a similar cost. Sometimes though, you'll just need to create an item with multiple effects in order to maximize efficiency. In such a situation, just remember to attach low-cost effects first and high-cost effects last. So, if you've been paying extra close attention, you may have noticed that these enchantment cost formulae don't factor in any of the things you'd usually expect, like your actual enchanting skill. <laughs> Those things come into play when determining whether or not you'll succeed at enchanting, if you're doing it yourself. On screen now, are both of the formulae used in this calculation. One for on use and on strike, and another for anything that's constant effect. Thankfully, they're quite similar. As before, let's take a look at each part of the formulae. Your base percent chance to succeed at enchanting is exactly your enchanting skill, point for point. From there, Every four points of intelligence and every eight points of luck will additively increase your success chance further by 1%. Then, 
Finally, the enchantment cost is multiplied by a number, which depends on the enchant type in question, and the result is subtracted from your success chance. Alternatively, as we touched on before, you can forego this whole process and just have an NPC perform the enchantment for you instead. Unfortunately, they charge ludicrous amounts of gold for even mundane enchantments. Fortunately, though, you can easily increase your own success rate at enchanting through fortifying spell effects and alchemy. You can do this by daisy chaining fortify intelligence potions. You can get high or maxed out success rates at even low levels. Let's uh, try to briefly go over the process here. So the first step would be, of course, to gather a fair amount of ingredients that contain fortify intelligence effects. These are ash yams, bloat, netch leather, and horker tusk. So always be on the lookout for these ingredients and try to keep them for when you want to go through all this. In addition to being relatively common, several vendors sell these items too. One such notable vendor is Meira Drora, <laughs> sorry, who resides in the temple at Nissus. She regularly restocks her supplies of bloat and netch leather, among other things. Once you've got your ingredients, you'll make one Fortify Intelligence Potion, drink it, and then use your newly fortified intelligence to make another, slightly better Fortify Intelligence Potion. You'll continue doing this until your intelligence is sufficiently high, and then create whatever enchantment you like. Consider enchanting a whole set of gear that fortifies your enchanting abilities, so that in the future, you will need potions, or at least as many. Just remember to save your game before starting this process, because at high levels of stats, you can actually crash your game depending on your hardware. And at really insane levels, I believe it's 50,000 plus intelligence, you can actually just crash the game's engine, regardless of how good or bad your computer is. So beware. Now, of course, in some circles, this process is considered a cheap exploit, while in other circles, this is considered just a clever use of game mechanics. As Morrowind is a single-player game, the choice is really up to you. As was promised previously, we'll briefly run through the items with the best enchant capacity. The best melee weapon for enchanting is the Ebony Staff with a 90-point capacity. However, because it sports low weapon damage, it's not well suited for an on-strike enchantment, but rather on use. If you're more keen on a powerful on-strike enchantment for a melee weapon, opt for the Ebony Scimitar from the Tribunal expansion. At 80 capacity, it's just 10 capacity shy of the staff, and it sports a healthy base damage. For ranged weapons, it's the Bone Mold Longbow that's best, with a capacity of 40. When it comes to the best armor for enchanting, you'll want to keep an eye out for these items that are on screen now. Mind you, that for whatever reason, it's only the right adamantium pauldron that has a 10 capacity. The left pauldron only has a capacity of 3. Also note that the Daedric Tower Shield has a whopping enchant capacity of 225. It's the highest of any item in the game, so really save any of those you find. Lastly, when it comes to clothing, things are relatively simple. All of the best clothing for enchanting has the exquisite prefix. Remember, you can have all pieces of clothing equipped alongside a full suit of armor, except for shoes and gloves because they occupy the same slot as boots and gauntlets, respectively. It's also worth noting that although the Daedric boots do have the highest capacity of any armor in that slot at 26.3, exquisite shoes actually have an enchant capacity of 40, which you go with is entirely up to you. 
Before I close out this guide, there's a couple pretty important warnings I ought to make about enchanting. The first is be extremely careful when using constant effects with bound item spell effects. For example, if you enchant your character's boots with a constant effect bound boots spell, it will crash the game. Plus, if you do something like enchanting your boots with bound greaves and your greaves with bound boots, you'll also crash the game. Lastly, there's another bug to keep note of when you create any fortify skill or fortify attribute enchantments with only a one second duration. Sometimes upon using such an item, the usual animation may play, but it won't actually produce a fortify effect on your character. So either try to keep track of that or avoid using one second durations on those types of enchantment effects altogether. Wow, well, that wraps up pretty much everything I can think about regarding enchanting immorally. Man, that was a lot. This may end up being the longest Morrowind guide I do. <laughs> Anyways, if any of that seemed overwhelming or intimidating, remember, you can always just save your game and experiment a little. Enchanting is, in my opinion, one of the coolest parts of Morrowind. Anyways, be sure to check out my other Morrowind guide videos if there's other parts of the game you're unclear on. And also have a look at my weekly Morrowind playthrough series, if you're into that kind of thing. Peace!